now we're going to be uh, starting chapter 10 and this investigates the auditory system including hearing aspects of language and music so what is it that is perceived when we hear sound waves actually reflect mechanical energy and we typically don't think of sound as mechanical but if we investigate the properties of a sound wave then it's a little bit more understood how this is so so a sound wave is the undulating displacement of molecules caused by changing pressure and so a sound wave is basically a wave of pressure that changes air molecules changes the way they are distributed and this can be sensed, this change in pressure and redistribution of air molecules can be sensed by receptors in your ears. So here are the, some properties of the sound wave. So first we have frequency and pitch. So this is the rate at which the sound wave vibration is measured as cycles per second, also known as hertz. So of course here you see a low frequency and here you see a high frequency. So this, if we have a wave, the rate at which the wave is vibrating, you know, basically how fast your car is traveling in miles per second, that elements of that speed, that is hertz. Amplitude and the perception of loudness, this is intensity. This is a sound is usually measured in decibels. So this is not how fast you know, the wave would be traveling or how fast your car is going, but this is the, how loud it is. So you have the frequency in terms of how fast it is traveling, and then you have the amplitude, which is how loud it is. You can have a soft sound, which is a low amplitude, and a high amplitude, which is a loud sound. You can have a high frequency, so you can have a high pitched sound, which is low amplitude, so it would be a a high pitch but it's soft sound you know something along those lines that uh, would be a sort of a like a little high ski sound but then soft and then you have complexity and timber and so this would be uh, aspects of perception of sound quality unlike the pure tone of a tuning force of, unlike the pure tone of a tuning fork most sounds are a mixture of frequencies so a sound's complexity determines its timbre, allowing us to distinguish, for example, a trombone from a violin playing the same note. So if I were to sing, I have no ability to sing whatsoever, but if I did know how to sing a, you know, an A, uh, or I guess what? Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Sorry, guys. But in the end, if you were to sing that, then we would sound different, despite the fact that theoretically we could be singing the same notes uh, that should be at the relative similar frequency. Of course, we could sing that louder or softer, but still uh, there would be differences in how we would sing them as a function of our own individual differences that give rise to these complexities. So in sum, frequency, amplitude, and complexity make up the three properties of a sound wave. All right, well, now we're going to talk about this, the three properties of a sound wave in a little bit more detail. So frequency, again, the number of cycles that a wave completes in a given amount of time. This is measured in hertz, which is cycles per second. And this corresponds to our perception of pitch. So a low pitch would be low frequency and a high pitch would be high frequency. So a high pitch and a low pitch low, high pitch, high, low pitch, low, and uh, there's reasons I'm not in a choir. And I do have an example of a high pitch sound that unfortunately does not play on my office computer, my Mac. It is, it plays on PCs. So if you have a PC and you load the slide, it's, then you can play the, the sound. But on the whole, it's this, this baby going through her sort of high high of a high pitched sound it gives you a high idea of high frequency so unfortunately it doesn't work on my on my computer but you can try it on yours and so that's why I'm talking about it briefly here 
So here are some differences in what uh, the different frequencies that humans and uh, different animals perceive. So the range of frequencies for us generally runs 30 hertz to all the way up to uh, looks to be about maybe 30,000 hertz. And then you can see this distribution for other animals. So whales have a very whales have a very large range of frequency or hertz that they can hear. Dogs have a similarly large ra uh, range. And then we have some animals that have a much smaller range, a smaller range, um, sea lions, rodents, bats, birds, frogs have a very small range. Fish, they have a smaller range. Interestingly, of course, these ones here can hear very low frequencies that we can't hear. Um, these animals here can see hear higher frequencies that we can't hear. So it's important when we think about the idea of sound that we remember that similar to this idea of what is sensed versus what is perceived, uh, we can only perceive what is sensed. Now the next property, amplitude. So amplitude is again the loudness of, corresponds to the loudness of a sound and it is measured in decibels. So we, our basic threshold for hearing, of course, would be um, a decibel of zero. 20 decibels would be a whisper. A typical room is chatting about 40 decibels. A busy street is um, about 85 to 90 decibels. Uh, what is particularly key about this graph here is that this area in red that prolonged exposure above 85 decibels produces hearing loss. So if you uh, are uh, an individual who probably like lots of individuals, my husband included, likes to listen to music loud in your headphones and your music is louder than a, uh, somewhat louder than a busy street corner, then you are damaging the receptors in your ear. And like most receptors in the central nervous system, they cannot be repaired. So the louder the music you listen to, the more uh, damage you can have, the more hearing loss, and this can get uh, especially greater hearing loss later on in life as you age. So a chainsaw, about 80 decibels, a chainsaw is quite loud. And uh, I'm not sure where they were measuring this sort of busy street corner, maybe somewhere in New York. But if your chainsaw, sort of the decibels of that, a rock band, you know, here, this is a really good example when you're trying to think about how much sound it is. If you go to a rock band, that's quite loud. You would only listen to your headphones for a little bit of time, the maybe 20 minutes a day, maybe an hour a day, that still be enough, that still, that could still be enough time cum cumulatively over multiple days, months, or years to result in some hearing loss. And then we have complexity, which is our final property. Uh, pure tones, these are sounds with a single frequency, and complex tones are sounds with a mixture of frequencies. So when we listen to music, we are typically listening to complex tones, and quite rarely are we listening to pure tones. And complexity tends to correspond to our perception of timbre or to uniqueness. And this is how we can distinguish between individuals in terms of the sound of their voices, even if they're saying the same things. This is also how we can distinguish between different instruments. And here is an example. This is a fundamental frequency right here. So this is a basic sort of pure tone. And then here we'd have overtones. This could be other tones that are in a particular sound. And so when you're listening to a clarinet, this could be the waveform. Well, this waveform as looks is pretty complex, but even though it changes across time, what this change across time represents is different types of overtones at different time periods. So you can have some very low, you can have some that are very high, and then the clarinet over time is going to move across these and when it moves from these various frequencies, it will look like this. But then as it moves across time, it is bringing in elements of these core frequencies. So these core frequencies 
can happen for, for just a moment, and they can be combined uh, over time. You can do multiple layers, uh, which of course would have occur in music that you're typically listening to sound from more than one instrument, um, whether that is a vocal instrument or a clarinet or a flute or something along those lines. So our perception of sound, how this occurs, relies on the physical properties of the sound wave. So what happens is the auditory system converts these physical properties of a sound wave, which would be amplitude, frequency, and then aspects of complexity, into electrochemical neural activity that travels to the brain. So sounds are the product of the brain. Our sensitivity to sound waves is extraordinary. So we can dis detect, based on sound, the displacement of an air molecule of about 10 picometers. And that's probably really hard to wrap your head around. But we are really good at detecting sound. So just think about having a, uh, a small little creek that kept, you know, creek in the w with the wind or a creek in the wall, something that captures your attention, a pin dropping. So we are very sensitive. To and since sounds are the properties of the brain, then I can tell you, and I can basically answer one of those age old questions. If a tree falls in the middle of the forest, and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Because if sound is produced by the brain and then no one is around to hear a tree falling, then that should kind of answer your question. So I'll leave it a little bit at that and then this will be one of the participation questions that will be posted so that you can ideally after this lecture you can go on and post the answer to the question. So there are a number of properties of language and music that are really important uh, in why they might be processed the way they are in the brain. So language and music convey both meaning and they evoke emotion. And it is likely that very early on in our development that language and even in this aspect, relatedly aspects of music, were prioritized and they were adaptive because the, they conveyed this combination. They convey meaning and they evoke emotion. If you think from a very, very basic perspective of a crying baby, then this is a sound. It conveys particular meaning and it evokes emotion surrounding, you know, oh, that there's something that's in pain. So this tells you what is happening with another person. And it's highly likely that music is some of the earlier forms of communication, trying to elicit aspects of emotion, calmness, excitement. We are primed as a species to hear music and to be sensitive to music, to differences and changes in frequency, uh, to be sensitive to rhythms, for example. And it's quite likely that this is also based on some of our very early evolutionary origins, that music conveys some of the emotion it does, that we have the strong preferences that we do because it is has such a strong biological foundation. So language facilitates communication. This we know. Without language, we would have a lot more difficulty communicating. And this is evidenced if you actually just try to communicate with someone of a different language. The distribution of both language and meaning across the brain has been primarily centralized to the left temporal lobe and the right temporal lobe specifically. So the left temporal lobe has been shown to be more involved in processing speech for meaning, whereas the right temporal lobe has been shown to be more involved in processing musical sounds for, me for meaning. So it is likely that both elements of language and appreciation of music evolved together, but then as we became more highly specialized beings, then uh, there was further lateralization. And lateralization basically means that something being uh, further defined as one uh, side or another. 
So there was further lateralization, further definition of language being processed on the left and music being processed on the right. Music, we tend to think of something that music as primarily for entertainment, but then it is very key for regulating our emotions and affect and the emotions of others. There are certain songs that make you feel very happy. There are certain songs that make you feel very sad in studies where you try to manipulate people's mood. Then uh, you will oftentimes play music to try to help with this mood, mood regulation process. And think also about when you go to watch a movie and how the score of the movie will try to align with the particular emotions and affect that the film at that time is trying to evoke. So uh, there are some key properties of language that are important. We hear variations of the sound as if they were identical. We have a unique perception of speech sounds. The auditory system has a mechanism for categorizing, sound, categorizing sounds as the same, despite small differences in pronunciation. So basically what this means is that I could be saying a particular sentence that I'm saying right now. Say I would say the following sentence. She sells seashells by the seashore. And so that's a tongue twister, most people know that. And because it's a tongue twister, and anytime you say any speech, you say it a little bit differently each time. She sells, she sells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore. She sells she, she seashells by the sea, seashore. So of course, as I get a little bit more used to saying it, then I'm going to try to relax. I'm going to say it differently. I mean, what is really important about the, the relationship between language and sound is that despite the fact that I said that um, five times, and I actually said it a little bit differently every single time, you knew what I was trying to say. So each time we say something, even if it's saying the the exact same content, our mouth produces those sounds in slightly different ways. And despite the fact that this language or the sounds that we make are produced in slightly different ways, they can be perceived by individuals as the same. So even if I say something differently, even if I say something with my mouth full, all sorts of things, thinking about how people, the various ways that they say stuff, and if they're tired, if they're excited, Despite all of those differences, which can sometimes be vast, we categorize the sounds as the same. We categorize the sound as representing a particular word or something along those lines. So this is really important. This represents something that is quite masterful in terms of what our brain is able to do because the sensation element, again, remember, sensation is objective and perception is subjective. In this sense, the objective sensation of sound would be quite variable, and yet the perceived elements of sound are the same. So our brain is going to be responsible for taking slightly different objective sensations and perceiving them as the same. Now, some of the primary properties of music, again, loudness, pitch, and quality. Loudness is related to the amplitude of a sound wave. Very loud to some is only moderately loud to others. Really good examples, differences in how people like to watch TV. Uh, do you like to tend, do you like to have the sound louder? Do you like to have the sound softer? Uh, my husband likes to listen to the, to the TV louder. It feels very loud to me. So then I will say like, turn that down, it's so loud. And he'll be like, I can barely hear it. Which of course to me sounds crazy but there are some individual differences in how loudness is perceived. Pitch is the position of each tone on a musical scale uh, with regards to sound wave frequency. And again, this is defined as the fundamental frequency regardless of timbre. And so this is a property of music. If people are going to have a good, if they have good pitch, that means that they can be in tune with the fundamental frequency and then they can use and they can combine that good pitch to be making sounds of high quality. And again, quality is the timbre of a sound regardless of pitch, so it's the combination of how sounds are put together. Now we have a new video.